<laughs> All right, the first of the year. And uh, what happens the first of the year every year? Uh, people make resolutions, don't they? They vow to do better in some area or another, or they vow to do more, or, or maybe in some cases do less of something they want to stop doing. But the sad fact is, over 90% of them never keep their resolutions. Uh, if you don't, uh, if, if you really want to see that, uh, clearly, come with me tomorrow to the gym. And we will, we will go in and we'll be lucky to find a locker. The parking lot will be full. Or maybe think back to your first day of classes at college or university, how at the first of the year you couldn't find a parking spot. Well then come back again in about a month. And there'll be all kinds of lockers available, all kinds of parking spaces will be available. The, the university analogy, you come back after the first major test and all of a sudden there are parking spots. So as Christians, we do the same thing. We make resolutions that we're going to do better, we're going to do more, we're going to uh, focus more on Jesus Christ, we're going to focus more on the needs of others, we're going to focus more on getting about our Father's business, and we all have good intentions, but what happens? Oftentimes, we go a little while, and then we sort of give up. Well, I think one of the main reasons for that, it's not that we're bad folks, it's, it's not that we don't have the ability to follow through on things, it's that we set this resolution, or to use a different terminology, we set this goal for the year, and it's a good goal, but we neglect to have a plan to reach that goal. You know, God said in Jeremiah 29, 11, I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. He has plans for us. Now you go on with that verse, you know, plans not to harm you, but to do good, give you a future and a hope. So if God has a plan for us, if God deemed it necessary to have a plan for our redemption, wouldn't it seem that we should have a plan to reach our goals also? Well, let's define our terms a little bit. As I said, a plan is a road map to reach our goal. If we don't have a road map, we're not going to get there. So this kind of begs the question, though, what is God's goal? What does God want to accomplish? Not just this year, but through all eternity. Well, as we read this book, from cover to cover, we see that God's goal is the redemption of the elect i.e. us, those who believe in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. His goal from all eternity past, states it in you know, Ephesians chapter 1 verse 5, before the foundation of the earth, he prepared this plan. And in that plan, he put our names, and the names of all those that would believe in Jesus Christ over the centuries. And his plan to carry that out is here in this book. You, you read in, in John, chapter 6, the Gospel of John. And he, he lays out his plan. It's very plain. No man, how many? None, can come to the Father except those given by the Father. And all those that are given to him will come in. Okay, now that's not a direct quote, it's a paraphrase, but that's what it says. Now, I encourage you to read John chapter 6 and John chapter 8. They're very encouraging because they lay out God's plan and then they guarantee God's plan. Okay? But if there's any flaw in God's plan, and there isn't because God is perfect, therefore any plan He makes will be perfect, but from our perspective, from my perspective, having watched people for uh, more years than I like to think, and having been one for as many years, I think, to me, the flaw is the instruments he's using to carry out that plan. And as Cherie read for us, his goal, build a church, redeem his people. But how's he going to do it? On Peter, he's going to build his church. Now you think about that. He says, blessed are you, Peter, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, 
but the Spirit did. And upon you, I'm going to build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Well, out of all the disciples, those of you that have been around church for a while, have read the stories, out of all the disciples, other than perhaps Judas, because we know how he ended up, who's the last one you would have picked? Peter, wouldn't it? Now remember, God put this plan in place before the foundation of the earth. He knew the beginning. He knows the end. He knows Peter's going to fumble around and deny him and do all this stupid stuff Peter does. You know, he's always shooting his mouth off and putting his foot in his mouth and, and doing things. You, and God says, hey, I'm going to build my church. I'm going to carry out my plan. I'm going to redeem my people by building this thing called the church and I'm going to do it on people just like Peter. There's encouragement there for us. Because believe me, I'm a lot like Peter, and so are some of you, to one degree or another. I put my foot in my mouth, I let God down all the time, I vow I'm going to pray more, I vow I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, and I, I fail and I fall down, and if God hadn't already showed me in His Word that He uses people just like me to accomplish this plan, I would be very discouraged. I would think, well, I might as well just quit and stay home. Because here I am, I blew it again. God says not to worry. I'm going to build my church on people like you, on people like Peter, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Now, some folks like to disparage the church. And they say, well, I can be a Christian and not go to church. I can be a Christian and not particularly like the church. Well, maybe that is in the realm of possibility. But it is certainly not going to be conducive to a good relationship with God. Now, why is that? Well, what does God call the church? What, what's one of his favorite words? His bride. Yes, his bride. Now, have you ever tried to have a close relationship with another couple where you didn't like one of them? You couldn't get along with one of them? You didn't like spending time with one of them? It's very difficult to have a close relationship. See? Let me read you a little quote here. This is a great quote. This is from Cyprian. He was uh, one of the third century uh, leaders of the church. One of the greatest, probably the greatest until Augustine comes along. Here's what he says. You cannot have God for your father if you do not have the church for your mother. God is one and Christ is one and his church is one. One is the faith and one is the people cemented together by harmony and the strong unity of a body. If we are the heirs of Christ, let us abide in Christ's church. Now you see that the terminology there, God and his bride, if we claim God as our father, kind of makes sense. His bride is our mother, doesn't it? Now, you may say, oh yeah, but this is wrong with the church, and that's wrong with the church, and there's something else wrong with the church. And you're probably right. There are a lot of things wrong with the church. And you want to know one of the major reasons? You're a part of it. We're all sinners. We all have problems. And when you put a bunch of us together, we have a lot of problems. And that's the whole point of the church. He puts us together. He says, focus on me. And by focusing on me, you will be able to work through these problems. It's God's plan to build his church. Now, if it's God's plan to build his church, wouldn't it make sense if we are to be his servants if we are to be his hands and feet, so to speak, here on this earth, shouldn't our plan also be to build his church? Absolutely. Absolutely. And we see after Peter uh, stumbled around and had some problems and that, he got busy 
when we get to the book of Acts, and begin to truly build God's church. Some may say, well, wait a minute. When he says he's going to build his church, he's talking about the universal church, not the local church. Well, you could say that. Some other terminology might be he's talking about the invisible church, not the visible church. One more, one that I, I like a lot is he's talking about the church triumphant, which is the ones that have already gone to be with God, not the church militant, which is us. But I think, logically, if you look at it, yes, he's talking about the universal church, yes, he's talking about the invisible church, but he builds that church, how? By building the local church. Because we go, we go from here to there, don't we? Yeah, we do. And that's God's plan. John Calvin said, our main task as Christians is to make the invisible church visible. See? So when people look at us and look at our church, they should see Jesus Christ. Wouldn't that be a good resolution for this year? To say, that every, I hope, I'm going to strive, I'm going to seek, so that every time someone looks at me or my life, they can see Jesus in it. They can see the handprint of the Holy Spirit on my actions. I think that would be tremendous. We have a purpose statement for our church, and normally the first of the year, I preach through that bit by bit. And our purpose statement is what? We exist to glorify God by gathering people, growing together, and giving ourselves away. That's a good purpose statement. That's biblical, isn't it? Yeah. That's building the local church, which will eventually become the universal church. Now, I've been around here a while, and uh, I've, it's been my observation that we do pretty good. We have three things there we're doing, right? We glorify God as the goal, and our plan for achieving the goal is to gather people, grow together, and give ourselves away. Okay? In my opinion, we do really well at two of those. But historically, we've not done real well at one of them. You say, uh-oh, now he's going to talk about money. He wants us to give more money. No, actually, I, I would like to congratulate you as a church. I think you give most generously. Well, obviously, we could always use more because there's always more missions, more things we could do. But I, I think if we have limited budget, it's not because you guys don't give generously. It's just because there aren't enough of you. We just need a few more people. So, and, and, and giving away, uh, you know, every month, uh, some of you go over to Open House Ministries and serve over there, and we go down here and to the Lutheran Church and we serve over there and we help them, and Dan and Skyler are always cooking up some new uh, way for us to serve. And, and those are good. You're good at giving yourselves away. We're pretty good at growing together. If you, if you look inside your bulletin there at uh, the things that are available for a church our size, you know, we have a lot of things available, a lot of venues for you to get involved and, and grow and, and mature and uh, learn more about our Lord. But the place I see that we lack is that very first one, gathering people. Gathering people. That's the hardest part. And why is that? because it's personal. It's a one-on-one -on -one thing. And we're all, well I shouldn't say we're all, but many of us are scared to death of that one-on-one -on -one encounter where I come up to you and I say, hey Scott, assuming Scott's not a member of this church, maybe not even a Christian, hey Scott, why don't you and your wife come to my church with me? And why am I so afraid of saying that? Because if he says no, it means he's rejected me. And none of us like to be rejected. But that's faulty thinking. That's the way Satan wants us to think. Because God has never asked a single human being to save anybody. 
God does that part. Our part is to invite. So the minute I say, hey, Scott, why don't you and Shannon come to church with me next Sunday? I am a success in God's eyes. That We need to get that driven into our heads. That makes me a success in God's eyes. Now it's up to the Holy Spirit to deal with them from then on. Okay. And as we begin to get that mentality, it will be easier for us to invite people. So this morning, that's what we're going to talk about a little bit. I'll just have two points. And the number one is, for 2014, plan to invite people. In chapter 14 of Luke, verse 23, it says this about inviting people. He was pretty, uh, pretty adamant here. He says, and the master said to the servant, master would be Jesus Christ, servant would be you and I, go out into the highways and hedges and compel people to come in that my house may be filled. Wow. So we're just supposed to go out there on the street, grab them, bring them in. That's what it says, isn't it? Compel people to come in. Well, Jesus makes his desire very clear here, doesn't he? He wants his house to be full. Okay. Well, we can accomplish that with the help of the Holy Spirit if we have a plan. So what if your plan was this? What if you plan to invite one person each week to come to church with you? Now, that's not asking a lot. That doesn't take... Uh, financial resources, it doesn't take college education, it doesn't take physical fitness. All it takes is the desire to carry out the master's wishes. Now it's a little bit threatening, I agree, but remember we need to understand that our success is in the inviting. You know, you can make it fun. You can enlist, enlist the aid of an, what I call an accountability buddy or partner or whatever. It can be your spouse. It can be someone else. And, and you just challenge each other. You know, hey, did you invite anybody this week? Well, no. Why not? Well, uh, 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 you know. And, and you can make it fun like that. You can put a bet on it. You can say, if I challenge you, if I'm your accountability partner and I challenge you, and you say, uh, 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 you're buying lunch. You know, you, it's okay, you can do stuff like that. And it kind of encourages us to be about the master's business. Now, compel, let's go back to that word, what, what does that mean? The, the New Living Translation puts it this way. It says, go out and urge them to come in. And I think that's probably a little more proper for what he's actually asking us to do. But with that word compel, I think he's also saying be compelling in your invitation. Don't say, well, I got to go to church next Sunday. The pastor's boring. <laughs> Music is too loud. You know, and that guy I sit next to, I don't like him anyway. Not very compelling, is it? No. So make a compelling case. Uh, be enthusiastic when you invite people. You know, everybody likes to tell a good story. Everybody likes to recommend some place to them. That, uh, somebody called me last week and wanted me to recommend a place where I get my car worked on. I'm glad to do that. It should be the same with our church. We should be eager to tell people when, when we have opportunity. To come to this place. You know, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, it says, Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all unto the glory of God. I think that verse just smacks of being enthusiastic. You know, be excited about your church and about what's going on. Someone told me here a while back, they said, If you want to change things, change yourself. Oh. I didn't like that. I forget what it was I was complaining about at the time, but they said, if you want to change things, 
change yourself. That makes a lot of sense. Be persistent. Just because they tell you no once doesn't mean you can never ask again. Don't be obnoxious, but be persistent. You can ask multiple times as opportunities arrive. Major on the positives. You know, well, you know we're a small church, and I don't, that's not a bad thing. You remember we went through the series on the seven churches? God never once mentioned size as a measure of their value. Okay. But we want to be a church that is gathering people because that's what God told us to do. We're a genuine church. We're a caring church. We're a serving church. We're a learning church. Make it personal. As I did with my illustration with Scott. I said, why don't you meet me at church Sunday? Or why don't you come with me to church Sunday? Or why don't you, know, you can do a lot of things. Come to church with me Sunday and then we'll go out to lunch or whatever. Yeah. Be compelling. Many, many, many will decline. But some will say yes. Then what do you do? Is that the end of your obligation? No. That's really the beginning, isn't it? It's just like our salvation. God calls us into his kingdom. That's not the end of it. That's the beginning of our lives as Christians. That's when we begin to serve. So we had the invitation, the plan to invite. Now the post-invitation. Hebrews 10, chapter 20, or verses 24 and 25. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meeting together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Now why would God have to say that? We believe in the plenary verbal inspiration of Scripture, which means every word is inspired by God. Well, in something as important as our salvation and our maturing in the Christian faith, I don't think God would write things in this book that we didn't need to hear. And he says here, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. In other words, don't neglect meeting together with other Christians. Now he says that because he knows we're going to have a tendency to neglect that. And Satan will do everything he can to exacerbate that tendency, to exploit that weakness in our human condition. So we need to be proactive about it. So you're... Your person or couple or family has accepted your presentation. Now what? Now when they set foot in the building, the responsibility corporately falls on all of us to make sure they can see that God is in this place. To make sure that they can see that the Holy Spirit is here and is moving in us. Now, the sort of circular problem here is though the corporate experience depends on individuals actions each one of us individually make up this corporate thing we call Parkside Church so each one of us has a responsibility to see to it that the corporate experience of coming to Parkside Church is a spiritually uplifting thing for them for our for our guests so you say eagerly, I'm sure. Well, what can I do, Pastor, to facilitate that? Well, a few things. And again, these things are all just so simple, not necessarily easy, but simple. Okay? First is, you should have a plan to show up. And you, you may say, well, what's the big deal about that? A plan to show up, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together. Okay? So do you have a plan for that? Now, I understand everybody takes vacations and things come up and all that. It's, it's not a legalistic thing. But do you more or less plan your activities so that you can be here 
the majority of the time. I know last Sunday, I was so impressed and so spiritually built up. You don't know sometimes how you're, the little things you do that you think are so insignificant, how they may really impact somebody else's life. Now here I am, I'm in here, and I'm in here early as I always am, and the worship team's getting here, and, and uh, she's homesick today. Uh, so I can tell about her because she'd be embarrassed but Cindy Forsen comes walking in the door what's Cindy doing here you guys were supposed to be uh, heading out for your camping trip this morning they have this annual camping trip they go every every year the first of the year meet these people and blah 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 well she says Donna's gone this week and so we delayed it so I could be here to play and I just felt gee I'm her pastor you know that's so cool that her and Brian would put off their trip their annual trip that they do the same way every year so she could be here to play that really made my day and she probably didn't think anything about it so just your showing up here can make a difference in somebody's experience of being at church Now, it does get a little harder here for some of you. In fact, my wife said, you're not really going to preach about that, are you? And I said, yeah. Make a plan not only to show up, I know this is hard, guys, but to show up early. Oh, I know, I know. Show up early. Well, why is that important to somebody else's corporate experience at Parkside Church? Because when you're here early, there's life here. There's activity here. And that's what draws people in. When you're here early, you have time to visit a little bit, get your coffee and that sort of thing, and time to focus. <coughs> you know, sometimes uh, it, it's that old well-worn anacronym from, from uh, or acrostic rather, from Sunday school class. Joy. You know, if you plan your life around joy, you'll have it. And joy is... Jesus, others, and yourself. So God comes first, others come second, you come third. And it'll make a huge difference. Sometimes I'm asked, uh, the people that know me uh, well know that my plan for sermon preparation is to have the sermon finished by Thursday evening. That way I have two days of flex time in there, things come up, and you know, don't always achieve it, but that's my plan. So they ask me sometimes, they say, well, if the sermon's done on Thursday evening, and you're all ready to go for Sunday morning, why do you show up at 7 o'clock Sunday morning? Nothing to do. Well, that's the whole point. I can show up at 7 o'clock. I can sit down, I can go over my sermon, I can have some coffee. The Holy Spirit has time to speak to me. He has time to, oftentimes I'll rewrite some of the sermon. It's the Holy Spirit. He says, no, that's not really good. Let's do this, let's do that. And it gives him time to work in my life. It gives me time to focus on God. It gives me time to give him all the stuff that I'm so focused on so that I can focus on others as they come into the church. Plan to be ready to worship when the service begins. One of the things uh, we're going to work on this year, I hope, is uh, getting into the sanctuary about five minutes. You know, about 10.25. I know it's pretty radical. Uh, but uh, when guests come in, oftentimes they're here first. And they sit down and are all by themselves. You know, come in and prepare. In, in the secular world, people do it all the time. I mean, you have to do it. I was pretty much a blue-collar person before I became a Christian. And, uh, you know, for instance, when I was a kid, I worked in the sawmills. Well, when you worked in the sawmill, uh, generally you had a machine and you were either on one end or the other of it. And the whistle would blow at 7 o'clock or whatever time you started and at 7 o'clock when the whistle blew everybody would come out of the coffee shop and go to their machines 
And if you believe that, you never worked in a sawmill because you'd been fired. Boom. On the spot. That had been the end of you. When that whistle blew, you had best be standing by your machine ready to push the button. Okay. Same thing when I, I, I drove a truck for Reading Transit Mix. You could get away with just about anything you wanted to do. They didn't care. But don't be late. You could be late once. You could be late twice, but you'd never be late a third time because the second time you're fired. Just that simple. Now, if it's that important to the secular world where you're dealing with sticks of wood and concrete on a truck that are going to make no eternal difference whatsoever, how important would it be to be here on time for God's people? I don't know. Figure it out. Then once you're here, once you're in place, plan to participate enthusiastically. And I know that's, that's hard too sometimes. And it's hard for me. The, the music thing just kills me. I can't sing, and it doesn't make any difference what it is, whether it's hymns or contemporary stuff or whatever it is. I can't sing it. I know it sounds terrible. And I can't clap, and I get all discombobulated. And, but I try. You know? And if we would all enter into the spirit in that way, it gives a signal to others that we enjoy being here. We enjoy singing God's praises. So you say, I'm not very good at it. Well, the best way to have God help you with it is to do it enthusiastically. You remember 2 Chronicles 16.9 that I like to quote a lot. You know, the eyes of the Lord search the whole earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to Him. And so often we get it backwards. We want Him to strengthen our hearts so we can be fully committed to Him. But He says, no, you get your hearts fully committed to me and then I will strengthen you. One of the biggest things people say they are looking for in our modern era is genuine worship. Genuine worship. So we can offer that. We can offer genuine loving relationships. That's another thing people are looking for. So this year, plan to focus on God, plan to focus on others. You know? Focus on the positives. At Parkside, we cannot offer lots of programs ran by a professional staff. It's just not going to happen unless God does a miracle and we become a great big church. We cannot offer Christmas pageants and Easter pageants complete with elephants and camels and all that stuff. It's not going to happen. You know? But there are some things we can offer. And what we can offer is a community of worshipers fully committed to Jesus Christ. We can offer genuine care and affection for people who come through that door, regardless of what they look like, regardless of who they are. So share that with people. You might be surprised. So I want to close with a quote here from Kevin, De Kevin DeYoung. He's the, uh, the pastor of the University Reformed Church in Linfield, Illinois. Does going to church every week make you a Christian? Absolutely not. Does missing church 35 Sundays a year make you a non-Christian? It does beg the question. God's people love to be with God's people. They love to sing praises. They love to feast at the table. They love to be fed from the scriptures. In frequent church attendance, I mean not going anywhere, on a regular basis is a sign of immaturity at best and unbelief at worst. For whenever God calls people out of darkness, he calls them into the church. If the Sunday worship service is the community of the redeemed, what does your weekly pattern suggest to God about where you truly belong? Pretty good quote. Pretty good quote. So as we uh, prepare ourselves for communion this morning, think about that. And think about asking the Holy Spirit to help you devise a plan this year to 
to join God in accomplishing his goal of building the church, of redeeming the lost, of creating that great thing we call the church triumphant, which will last forever and ever. Father, thank you for your word this morning. Thank you, O oh God, that you love us enough to uh, invite us into your kingdom and then to make us players in your plan. Lord, you use frail, flawed people. And we appreciate that. And so, Lord, as we go to communion, help us to really focus on you, to do a little business with you, to spend a couple of minutes hearing from you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.